In this video, we're going to sculpt Amy Winehouse and see how much progress you can make in just one month. Kind of. So a few weeks ago, I uploaded a video of me sculpting Amy Winehouse and I'm going to be honest with you, I was quite proud of it and I was excited to upload this masterpiece that would become perhaps the worst performing video that I've ever uploaded to YouTube. I kind of felt embarrassed at how confidently I delivered the information in that video, like somehow I knew what I was talking about and the imposter syndrome just kind of took over. And you know what? I loved it. I mean, don't get me wrong, it was an unpleasant experience, but what I've come to realise on this artistic journey that we're all on is that it's these experiences that you feel the most are the most that help you grow. Now, in case you didn't see the video, basically what I did was re-sculpt a model of Amy Winehouse that I'd done six years before in 2017. You know, just as a little test of myself to see how much I'd improved and maybe even inspire some of you watching to get out there and recreate one of your own pieces. And look, I know you're not supposed to care how social media responds to your work and to a certain extent, I get that. But equally, you want to keep in mind that art is a form of communication and if your message isn't landing, then it's in your best interest to figure out why. So while I would agree that you shouldn't let social media affect you to the point that you're no longer saying what it is you want to say, I do think it's important to reflect on situations like this and try to figure out why your message isn't quite being received. Now I did have a sneaky suspicion as to why this piece didn't land, but it was summed up perfectly by the unforgiving comment section. In 2017, it was more like Amy, a character image, and no, just a cute face. It turned out a banal Disney face. Pops. I'm not entirely sure why they called me Pops, but the message was pretty clear. It didn't look like her, which struck a chord with me because I knew he was right. I could sculpt the nicest looking model you've ever seen, but if the title says one thing and the thumbnail says another, communication has already failed. So now I'm faced with two choices. I can either cry about it, again, or I can learn from this and try to grow from it. So here it is, one last time, my attempt at sculpting Amy Winehouse six years later. Let's see how we get on. So what I'm doing here is kind of an old school approach to creating characters in 3D called box modeling. And while it isn't quite as sexy as sculpting right off the bat, it eliminates a whole part of the workflow called retopology. And since box modeling adds less work time than retopology, it's more efficient, so that's why I've started doing it. Now, if you're new to 3D, I can appreciate that this step probably looks a little bit weird and maybe a bit complicated, but it's basically the same steps every time. So what I do is just keep a cheat sheet off to the side with all of the steps and avoid making time consuming mistakes. Now to explain this technique to you properly, I'd need to dedicate a whole video, which is something that I am planning to do soon, so bear with me. But if you are interested in a full course on sculpting a stylized head, I do offer that course, which you'll find linked below and I go over sculpting, retopology, texturing and so on, so be sure to check it out. Now, after a bit of work, the model starts to look something like a head, so at this point I subdivide it and start working on the second level of detail. Now, at this level of detail, we can start slowly working in some creases with the eyelids and make the edges on our lips a bit sharper. Now, the way I did the eyelashes was to first duplicate the head then on the new head, I selected the faces where the eyelashes were going to be, hit Ctrl I to invert the selection, and then just delete the parts we don't need. That might sound complicated, but it really only takes about five seconds. Then I can use the bit that's left to start modeling the eyelash. Now, on a lot of my models, I will just use this shape to represent the eyelashes, but on this model, this is just a temporary standing while we're still in the early stages. Now, I could have created the eyebrows in the same way, but the topology isn't flowing the same way I want the eyebrows to, so I used a slightly different approach and modelled the brows directly on top of the head. Now I'm not really convinced by these eyelashes, so I decided to import some eyelashes that I'd made for an old model. And I'm just playing around with ideas here, and eventually I do go with a more realistic style later on. Moving on to the upper torso, I dropped in a sphere and then just started pushing and pulling it around into sort of an upside down triangle. 
Then I just duplicated it and then rotated it to create the lower torso. In this case, the lower torso won't actually be seen in the final render, but having it there is gonna help me find the proportions for the arms because your elbows roughly line up with your belly button and your wrists roughly line up with your um, tally whacker if you've got one. I added another sphere and start shaping the shoulder. And I'm not trying to make anything perfect yet. This is all very low detail so that I can move stuff around without fear of messing anything up. I get the hair started once again by adding in a sphere and pushing it around for a while. And then I did the same thing for the bobbly bits, making sure to pull them into a nice teardrop shape like this. The arms start off as a couple of cylinders this time, which means that all the pieces we need are now in the scene. Now we just want to spend a bit of time bouncing around each of our body parts, trying to get them to work together. But there's only so far you can go before you need to mesh them into a single piece, because all of these shapes overlap in one way or another. The next shape to add is the famous beehive. Now, really, I'd wanted to get a likeness of Amy before adding this because I didn't want her to be only recognisable for her hair, but I decided it's best to add it in now because it will help me see the character coming together as a whole and better inform my decisions moving forward. Or at least so I thought, because right about now, I got completely lost. It seemed like none of the strokes I were making were correct and the face fell further and further away from Amy. I started to feel demotivated and like I just wanted to give up. Not only did it not look like Amy, but it didn't even look like a head anymore. The anatomy was just completely broken. I don't want to do this anymore. And we've all been here, faced with two choices. Do we carry on or do we start a new one? Well, I was on a mission of redemption, so pushing on was my only option. And the best thing for this situation is to take a break. So that's what I did. After a break, it was back to it, this time with fresh eyes. And after a lot of back and forth, eventually things started to improve and people in the live stream chat even started to accurately identify who she was supposed to be. While this is still a long way from finished, at least it seems to be back on the right track. Now, since I'd sculpted this body from scratch, I did need to retopologize that portion, which is what you can see me doing here. Now, if you're new to 3D or to retopology, what I'm doing is basically modeling over the top of the sculpt so that it looks kind of like how the head looked near the start of this video. A benefit of doing this is that I can now attach the body to the head. Now we just need to sculpt on our higher subdivision levels and make it look a bit more believable. After a bit of tinkering, I can now start rigging the model. Now, rigging is essentially a process of building a skeleton inside our model. Once we've done this, we can use the bones of the skeleton to move our character around. Now, I wouldn't say that rigging is what I'm best at, but I understand enough to get my characters paused. Now, if you're interested in learning more about rigging and getting your characters animated, I can highly recommend the course The Art of Effective Rigging in Blender. Now, I've run through this course myself and I learned an absolute ton of information, so be sure you check it out using the link in the description below. Once the characters rig, I can start pausing her, but first, I want to model the shirt while she's still symmetrical. Modeling while the character is in a symmetrical position means I only need to model one side, while the other side gets mirrored by Blender. Once the shirt is modeled, I can then subdivide it for more resolution and start improving the shape. Now shirts can be tricky and for the collar I decided to make this separate from the shirt itself. Now of course this isn't accurate in reality but it's much easier to sculpt it this way and given that I'm only going to be rendering out a still image it's very easy to disguise the fact that it's not connected to the shirt. It's a bit sneaky but you've got to get away with what you can. I made the knot at the bottom from another sphere and just sculpted some details into it. And I know it looks a bit poor now, but I do intend to improve this as we move along. 
When you're sculpting wrinkles and folds, you want to be thinking about the underlying form and how the cloth would react to it. And of course, use reference because it'll really help you to do a better job. It's also a good idea to sculpt the wrinkles and folds while the character is paused because the pause will affect how the cloth behaves. So I only take them so far at this stage and then come back to them later. Now for the fun part, pausing the character. In my last attempt at sculpting Amy, I was a bit more adventurous with the pause, but in this one, I reined it back in. I wanted Amy to be the focal point of the piece, as opposed to what she was doing, if that makes any sense. With the pause now in place, I could start working on the hair. And I usually wait until now, now that the character's paused, to start pushing the hair, because if I create the hair in a neutral pause, the shapes might not necessarily work once I start moving things around, so I'm avoiding potentially having to rework the hair later on. At first, I just keep the shapes quite large and loose, and my primary focus here is trying to create a nice silhouette for the hair. So I'm mainly looking at the camera view now, and paying close attention to the negative space. I then make marks on the mesh to indicate directionality and flow of the hair, which will help me when I start laying hair curves on top of these basic shapes, which I'm about to do right now. Now I'm keeping the hair curves really simple because the intention was to convert them all to geometry later and sculpt over them, but I didn't end up sticking to this plan as we'll see later. For now, I'm trying to add visual interest to the curves by adding twists and turns, but notice in the camera view that I'm sticking as best that I can to the silhouette we created with the base hair. And that's also why I've left the material white, so that I can easily differentiate between the curves and the hair underneath. Then once I have it mostly covered, I can switch this to black and continue working. And I start to feel like this is coming together now. It's not quite there yet, but I could just feel that it was getting closer and everything seemed to be moving quite smoothly. Until... Disaster. It's no secret that a lot can go wrong when you're working in 3D, but this shouldn't happen. And the worst part is, it's an issue that I run into all the time without really knowing why. That was until some angel fell into my Twitch chat to help me understand what was going on. Basically, the issue seems to have something to do with using a multi-resolution modifier. This much I'd worked out by myself. But what I didn't know is that when you're using this modifier, you're not supposed to change your model in edit mode, which happens to be something that I do all the time. So while I did end up losing a bit of work, at least I think I now know what's causing it, so we shouldn't run into that issue again. So just to reiterate, when you're using a multi-res modifier, it's sculpting tools only from there on in. Now, as I said, the plan with the hair curves was to convert them all into geometry and sculpt details over the top of them. And this is what I started doing. However, the poly count was starting to rise quite dramatically and would eventually slow down my computer. And if I'm being completely honest, I was getting a bit bored, so instead I converted the meshes back into curves and added detail into the cross section of the curves themselves. And if none of that made any sense, I've got a tutorial on this linked in the description below. Now if you've seen any of my previous videos or live streams, you'll know that tweaking the hair like this takes forever. So let's enjoy a quick montage, and if you're enjoying this video, please give it a thumbs up and don't forget to subscribe for future content. After a lot of faffing, it was finally time to do one of the parts I enjoyed the most, painting the skin. But first, I need to give it some quick and dirty UVs. In case you don't know, UV mapping is essentially the process of cutting the model up into pieces so that the model can be laid down as though it were flat. So now we have a 2D version of our 3D model. The reason we do this is because computers interpret images in 2D space, so we need to make a 2D version of our 3D model in order to paint our textures. Think of it like this toilet roll tube. Now at the minute it's a bit like a cylinder in Blender, but if we cut the tube up one side, 
we can now lay it down flat. Now that the tube is flat, we can draw on it in 2D like we normally would. And then when we put the tube back together, our image exists in 3D space. Fortunately for us, Blender takes care of a lot of this under the hood so that we can paint directly onto our model in 3D space. And if you're smart and you're thinking, yeah, but Danny, you're using vertex paint. Well, I'm still gonna be baking this down onto an image map later, so I need UVs. Finally, I can start painting the skin, which I do by giving it a base color and then painting a bit of red on the cheeks and lips. I also add a little red to the ears and nose and darken the areas surrounding the eyes. And so far, I've been using those original eyelash shapes we made at the start to indicate the big winged eyeliner famously worn by Amy, but now it was time to commit that to actual paint on the model. Now, looking at this in a rendered view in cycles, I was starting to get a bit excited. This was starting to look like Amy, uh, certainly a lot more than my last attempt anyway. I started to feel confidence and relief, but learning from my last video, I wasn't gonna let me get ahead of myself. There's still work to do. For the earrings, I inserted a torus and just played around with the thickness before placing it in her ear. Nice and easy, job done. Let's move on to the tattoos. Now, I'll be honest, the original plan for these tattoos was to be really lazy and copy and paste the tattoos from the previous model that I did. But then I realized that I'd paused it in the opposite direction to the last model. So we're now looking at her right arm instead of her left. And of course, she has different tattoos on her right arm. Now, I did strongly consider using her left arm tattoos and just flipping the image in Photoshop later, but in the end, I just remade them. We can only see three of them in this pose anyway. The way I did that is I found replicas of the tattoos online and then enlarged them and edited them in Photoshop. Now, I could use these images to paint the tattoos directly onto a skin, but a simpler and less destructive approach is to insert the images as planes and then wrap the planes around the arm. A few tweaks of the shader later, and they kind of look like tattoos to me. Then I had a few finishing touches, and by a few, I obviously mean I was there for hours just making tiny little tweaks that you probably wouldn't have noticed anyway, and then get to work on lighting the character. Now, I was already happy with the position of a key light that I'd put in earlier, but I just wanted to add a couple of rim lights on either side to make a pop that little bit more. Once these were in place, I could then render out an image and bring it into Photoshop for further tweaking. Now, just before we get to the final image, I just wanted to remind you that the point of doing this was to see if I could learn from my mistakes in the last effort and improve on it. So the question is, did I succeed in doing that? I don't know. I think I have, but I was wrong last time. But I'm sure you'll let me know in the comments if you have any other ideas. So here it is, my revised attempt to sculpt a stylized Amy Winehouse six years later.